Hi, I'm Pam Fox at pamfox.org. Welcome, if you're just coming in, say hello. I'm just gonna share this out to the 28 day challenge group. All right, good morning, I'm Pam Fox at pamfox.org, and in today's video, I'm gonna be doing Q&A. So, um, as you come on, make sure to say hello in the comments section, and um, if you have a question, go ahead and post it below, and if I have time, I will get to it during the live. Um, so, we'll just go ahead and get started with today's question, is from Krista Morris. And it's actually a long question, and there are actually several questions within the question. So again, if you're coming on, hi, Susan. Be sure to say hello in the comments section below. And if you have a question, I will try to get to it today. Um, but this is a bit of a, a follow-up from last week's live about hiatal hernias. But certainly if you have questions, um, if you're in the 28-Day Challenge group and you have questions about anything, go ahead and post them below, and I will get to them if I can. Hi, Pamela. I uh, hope you're feeling better. Okay, so um, the question from Krista. Um, I'm gonna go down to where the question starts. However, I have always been very active and have always been taught that a strong core and abs are vital to good health, posture, and movement. Following your advice to relax my abs and let this area become as soft as possible is really hard for me and whenever I do it I feel like my posture and lower back suffers so let's stop right there she's actually got several really good questions um, for me within this post but we're gonna stop right there so she's talking about how can one heal a hernia as well as maintaining a strong core and good posture so first of all when it comes to the core, I mean, all of us have heard the importance of a strong and healthy core, which is basically all of the musculature here around the torso. So the abs and the back, the obliques, all of the musculature that supports our bodies, right? The ability to stand up, sit down, reach up, bend over, walk, run, jump, climb, all of that stuff. And is it important to have a strong core? Well, yeah, it is. Um, is there an overemphasis on this? Well, I mean, it really just depends on who you are and what you do with, with your body and with your life. I mean, obviously, if you're an Olympic athlete, then you're going to need a stronger core than, you know, somebody that sits at a desk all day. But somebody that sits at a desk all day needs a strong core as well. Um, but here's the thing about your core, about your abs and your obliques and your, your back muscles. As long as you... Uh, have a normal, you know, average moving life, you know, if you're not lying on the couch 24-7, um, you're engaging and using those muscles, okay? So all gross motor movements, which is what I just said, you know, stand up, sit down, run, walk, climb, jump, bend over, the movements that use your, your body, that use your torso, those are your, the, you know, gross motor movements. So fine motor movements would be, you know, little, little movements. Um, um, but gross motor skills, they, they include your core, they work your core, they activate your core, and so those muscles are always being used and worked. They're always being used and worked. So um, they can become weak. Usually it's because of an extreme lack of activity, so being extremely sedentary. Maybe you have a desk job. Maybe you have no job and you just lie around all the time. So in, in that case, um, those core muscles can become weakened and need improvement, need support, need work. Um, there can be an imbalance too, and that's really the more, the more common thing. So typically um, issues with posture or issues with weight, being overweight, 
can cause an imbalance. So where you have, you know, a lot more weight on the front because you're heavy bested or you have a large belly, then can create, you know, um, stretched muscles and weakened muscles and overused, um, poorly flexible muscles in the back. Um, so that, that can create an imbalance in your core that needs some work and support. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is, generally speaking, uh, you know, most people, they, they work and activate those muscles all the time. Now, does that mean that we, sh we don't ever need to exercise them, those muscles? That's not what I'm saying. Um, but you may need, those muscles may need more stretching than working, or they may need more working and stretching, or they may need more relaxing. I mean, it really needs to be a balance of all three. Uh, you know, stretch, muscles need to be worked, they need to be stretched, and they need to relax. Those are their three primary functions. So, you know, if you think about like a hamstring, for example, you know, the back of your, um, the back of your thigh, those muscles, you know, you have difficulty as you get older touching your toes. And that's because those hamstrings have become so tight and inflexible. And why does that happen? It's because we don't bend over and touch our toes. We don't... That, that, that disuse of those hamstrings then makes them inflexible. So, so when it comes to reversing a hiatal hernia, it's just, it's just a period of time in your life where your focus is on moving the stomach down and strengthening the diaphragm. So your focus is shifted from, you know, working the abs <laughs> to reversing a hiatal hernia. So during that time, you're, you're not going to be doing planks, you're not going to be doing sit-ups, because those are going to push your stomach up, your diaphragm down, and, and create that pressure of pushing your stomach further into your diaphragm. So I just want to help you, Krista, and others who are concerned about this, maybe those of you who like to work out and incorporate in a, an ab workout. Um, this is just a period of time. You can certainly, you know, do, I do ab exercises, I, I'm not obsessed with them. I don't do a lot of them, but I definitely feel my abs engaging when I do certain exercises in the gym. And then I just take time to stretch those ab muscles after I do those exercises, which means what? Which means, you know, stretching these muscles means expanding these muscles. So I just push my stomach out, inflate my stomach like a balloon, and that stretches those muscles. And it allows the, the stomach to move back down by doing that. Um, so, so that's the first thing I want to say about that. And then you also mention your lower back. Um, at some point in this post, you mentioned your lower back. So this would require just incorporating something that would support that back. So your back moves in four primary ways. It twists, it flexes, and it extends, and also side to side. So um, there are a lot of great exercises you can do to support your back in this, you know, even from your chair, you can do that. I'll do all four of them right now from my chair. So if you turn to your right side and grab either the arm of your chair or the back of your chair and look over your right shoulder and really just relax and allow that to stretch. You can do that on both sides and you can do this throughout the day if you're at work or I mean, I've even done this in my car when I'm driving long stretches. So I'll keep my eyes on the road, but I'll kind of, you know, turn and do this and turn and do that. So that's the rotation. And then if you give yourself a hug and relax your shoulders, you can try this with me right now. It feels really good. You'll feel really refreshed and rejuvenated when you're done. Relax your shoulders and then round your back and drop your head down. So that's going to stretch your back this way just hold that and breathe and relax look for any tension and just let it go and then you want to do the opposite direction so you lean back in your chair and arch your back and lean back relax your abs this is a great exercise for your hiatal hernia and then side to side so just like a side reach or even just leaning to the side so you have this stretch this way and so that your spine is doing this so you can do this or if that's too much you can do this and you want to go you know both ways so that's a great little way just to incorporate in making sure you're giving the back the support it needs because when we do these hiatal hernia stretches a lot of people do tell me that it creates more pain and um, discomfort in their back or their shoulders or their neck so that just means you're doing an exercise that's creating another you know, there's just some compensation that's happening that's new. And so, you know, you relax your abs and it can cause strain on the low back. 
Well, that doesn't mean it's that relaxing your abs is a bad thing. And it, it means that it's something new that's causing some strain in your low back and you need to then incorporate something that's going to support the low back. All right, so Debbie Johnson Protho, good morning. She says, all of these stretches help me and I have symptoms of a hiatal hernia, but they tell me I don't have one. Oh, they tell you you don't have a hiatal hernia. That's, uh, I hear that a lot, Debbie. Um, I see it a lot in several of the support groups that I'm a member of on Facebook where people will actually go in and do the diagnostic testing and they're, told, and they're, they're just sure they have a hiatal hernia because they have all the symptoms and they discover that they don't have a hiatal hernia. So there's a couple of things, there's a couple of, of explanations for this. One is they can miss it. Depending on the type of exam that you have, um, they can miss it. They're not 100% accurate. Two is, in fact, I was just reading in the group yesterday, someone went in and had a test done. They went back to another doctor and had a different diagnosed, a different type of test done, and they did find a hiatal hernia. In fact, it was a rather large one, and they totally missed it. Good. Um, Debbie says when she pushes down and, she, and moves it, it feels better. And so, so that's one. They can miss the diagnosis. Two is, if you have a sliding hiatal hernia and it's small, um, you could go in for a test and it might happen to be down when they do that test and so they miss it that way but um, I think that I think that probably and this is just my opinion obviously but I think that what is probably most common what happens for people is they can have a very small hiatal hernia that's not detectable but it's still causing all of the symptoms small doesn't mean small symptoms um, or they can have what I call a prehiatal hernia, which isn't even a real thing. I mean, it is in my opinion, but it's not like in the textbooks. So basically, um, if you have a hiatal hernia, your stomach is pushing through your diaphragm. But um, one of the doctors that I follow says that, um, actually there's a study that, uh, that I looked up and referenced, and it shows that, and I've talked about this before, that um, in these populations in Africa where people eat a primarily plant-based healthy, you know, plant strong diet, they see this. When they look at their when they look at images of their stomach, it's way down here underneath the diaphragm. But in Americans where we eat a typical western diet, the diaphragm the stomach is right up here, it's located up against the diaphragm. And these are people without a hiatal hernia. So then what does that mean? It means your stomach is pushing up against your diaphragm, and even if it hasn't popped through, this is putting pressure on the diaphragm, it's putting pressure on the stomach, it's putting pressure on your esophagus, and it's putting pressure on your lower esophageal sphincter, and it can put pressure on your vagus nerve. Just this. So all of those pressures can cause the same symptoms that hiatal hernia causes, okay? And so then just getting that stomach to move down um, so for people with a pre-hiatal hernia, you are, and you have all of these symptoms and you're being told by your doctor, well, we've run all the tests, you're perfectly fine, we don't know what's wrong with you. You're actually very fortunate because for you to move that stomach down is going to be a lot easier than someone with a hiatal hernia. But thank you, Debbie. I appreciate um, that feedback. I really appreciate that feedback. Oh, hi, Krista. Okay. When I forward fold as with yoga or bending to pick something up, I feel like I'm bending over a tender lump in my abdomen just above my stomach. Okay, let's see. And I feel a lot of discomfort and pressure in my throat. Yeah, okay, so what? Okay, so Krista, I don't know if you just came on, but I'm addressing your question. We're talking about um, all of the things you posted about um, your abs and your hiatal hernia and your symptoms. I'm just kind of going through those, but um, but so yeah, um, when you bend over, you feel a tender lump just above the stomach. So typically, most people, you know, here's center, here is left, even though it looks like right. This is my left side because everything's backwards. Left, here is my rib cage, and typically the hernia is here. It can vary from person to person, but typically the hiatus is here, and the hernia is right in this location here. And so then when we bend over, that puts pressure on that hernia. And yes, for many people, there is a lump there, a lump that you can feel and sometimes you can even see. I've seen, you know, uh, um, images of hiatal hernias where you can see that lump with your eyes from the exterior because it's so large and because it's pushing out this way as much as this way. 
Um, so you feel a lot of discomfort and pressure in your throat. So yeah, um, when you have a hiatal hernia, one of the things that typically happens is um, there's pressure, we were just talking about, I don't know if you just joined us, Krista, but there's pressure on the vagus nerve. And so the vagus nerve innervates the esophagus and the stomach and many, if not all, almost all of the organs within the chest and the abdominal cavity, which means it supplies nerve function um, and nerve flow to that nerve. And that nerve has got a lot of important functions in the body. And I always bring up carpal tunnel because it's just a great um, um, comparison when you, because it's such an ep epidemic thing and so many of you have, can kind of relate to carpal tunnel, but the nerves here that run through the, the carpal tunnel, when, when, they be, when everything here becomes inflamed, it puts pressure on those nerves, okay? And so then we have a pinched nerve or nerves in the carpal tunnel. And so then what is the result of that? What happens? Well, we can have pain and tenderness here, but most of us will have pain, tenderness, numbness, tingling here because it radiates beyond the pinched nerve. And so the same thing is true with the vagus nerve. If we have a pinched vagus nerve down here, um, just depending on your hiatal hernia and your vagus nerve and how everything sits, your health, your, um, your level of activity, all of that can, can factor in. But that can cause, um, it can cause a whole number of things like anxiety, heart palpitations, panic attacks, and discomfort and a lump-like feeling in your throat is also one of the symptoms. Um, Debbie says, I feel a lump is there. Yeah, so that's a very common, um, it's one of those kind of common mystery symptoms where Someone will go into the doctor and say, I've got all these symptoms, and then they'll diagnose you with a hiatal hernia, or in your case, Debbie, they won't. <laughs> but they'll diagnose you with a hiatal hernia. I hear this all the time. I had a doctor say it to me. You, I see you have a hiatal hernia, but that shouldn't cause you any issues. And yet we have all of these issues. <laughs> so unfortunately, many doctors aren't, they're just, I mean, I, I don't want to sound um, cocky because I understand this and they don't, but they don't understand it. A lot of them don't understand it. I had to go to, to a number of doctors, um, and they all said the same thing. Okay, yeah. Well, what about this hiatal hernia? Well, yeah, you've got a hiatal hernia, but that shouldn't be a that shouldn't. You know, it's small, so it shouldn't cause you any issues. I mean, yeah, if we have a larger hiatal hernia or a strangulated hiatal hernia, they're concerned. But when it's small, they're not concerned, even though you have this long list of symptoms. All right, so. Susan says, when my stomach is bloated and will press on my vagus nerve and cause palpitations. Yeah, I think, I don't think you're asking, I think you're stating, but yeah, definitely. Palpitations, yeah, that's very common. And anxiety and even extreme panic attacks where people have even said, I never experienced this, but they feel like they're going to die. Like they'll wake up in the middle of the night and they're just like, I'm going to die. <laughs> I, I can't relate to that because I've never had that happen, but I've heard it so many different times. They don't think outside the box. Yeah, yeah, that, unfortunately you're right, Debbie. And also they just, you know, doctors aren't perfect. They're not gods. They, they have the training that they have. They have the knowledge that they have. They have the experience that they have, and that's it. So, you know, if you're going to a doctor that's not able to help you, it's time to find a new doctor, and, and, and that's not easy. I mean, I had to go through several doctors, and honestly, I never did get the help that I was looking for. I, I learned more from the internet. I mean, not to, I don't want to bash doctors. I know they save lives every day and they've been helpful. I had a doctor that was very helpful to my son at one point in his life. Um, so, you know, they help and save people all the time. But they're not gods and they don't know everything. Okay, so we can't fully put our faith and our trust 100% in doctors. We have to do a lot of the work ourselves. And sometimes that means finding a doctor that's getting the results that we want. They're helping people get the results that we want. That's who we want to trust because they know what they're doing, you know, if they have a specialty. All right, so Krista, I'm going to move on because you bring up a lot of really good points that I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, moving down um, along your post, she says, um, even learn to full. Even learning to fully let go and relax my belly. So we talked about this last week. Relaxing the abs is the first step in reversing a hiatal hernia. 
creates a very unpleasant sensation where it feels as though I am allowing weight, my stomach I guess, to pull my diaphragm down with it as I let it drop. So we're going to stop there. So you, you've kind of got it right, Krista, but um, so okay, so your diaphragm moves up and down with every breath. It moves up and down with every breath. And if you've got a hiatal hernia, then it's doing this. It's taking the stomach with it. So then if you start to do these exercises where you're attempting to do this, okay, diaphragm up, stomach down, and it's pulling, but it's not doing this, it's just pulling, okay? That can cause, um, you say you, it feels as though, so what's happening then is it's not pulling your diaphragm down, it's just stuck and it's trying to pull apart. And these tissues of your diaphragm and your stomach and your esophagus, your LES, all of those things are already, they're irritated, they're injured, they're inflamed. So they're already agitated. Now you're trying to tug on it even more. And so then you're saying you're experiencing um, nausea, a gross feeling, um, you know, pain, unpleasant sensation, um, feeling like it's pulling down your diaphragm, and it doesn't feel good, basically. Um, so, and Susan says, that's how I feel. A heavy sensation. Okay, so, so a couple of things about this. One is to understand what's happening. Understand that, um, that as you're trying to create that separation, but it's hanging on, so again, if you have a prehiatal hernia, that's helpful because it's a lot easier to move that stomach down. If you've got a really small hiatal hernia, that's helpful because it's going to be easier. It may I had a small hiatal hernia and it took me a couple of weeks. And I'm going to share my personal story of the day that I'll never forget where I fully dislodged my stomach and got instant relief. I'm going to share that story in a moment. But um, it's just going to be different for everybody how long it takes to get that separation. All right, but as you're doing that, it can create um, it can create more discomfort, and so that's why I always say that you need to think about the long game on this. You need to think about the big picture, and there needs to be a daily commitment to a practice. Okay, where you're gonna maybe set an alarm on your phone, and lie down and relax, or sit down, or go to a private place where you're not being interrupted or disrupt or you know, where you can really focus on this and relax. I'm trying to get warmed up this morning. It's really cold in this office, and I don't like to run my heater because I know it's loud. Um, so I'm drinking my dandy blend this morning. But um, think about the long game. Think about the long game and a daily practice. Um, and Krista is saying it's very uncomfortable. So, But you're starting to have progress. Good. Yes, um, so that's where it's tricky, Krista, because we don't want to do something that creates more pain and discomfort. That's our body's way of telling us to stop. Okay, pain and discomfort is our body's way to tell us you're doing something that's harmful, make a change. Um, so we have to listen to that. On the other hand, if we want to naturally reverse, reverse our hiatal hernia, we have to commit to a practice. And so this is why I advise being very consistent but very gentle okay so one thing you can make sure to do is um, do this practice on an empty stomach so if you've got a very large full stomach of food with a band around it because you have a hiatal hernia so this would represent your diaphragm so here's your stomach up here in the chest cavity and here it is where it belongs down here in the stomach in the abdominal cavity but you've got this band around it and now you're pulling on it and it's full it's not going to go anywhere, and it's just going to further ag aggravate the tissues of the diaphragm, the vagus nerve, and the stomach. All right? So, so if this is really causing more agitation, make sure that you're doing this on an empty or at least a partially em empty stomach. Because if you're trying to move an inflated balloon through a hole versus a deflated balloon, do I have a deflated balloon here? <laughs> I do versus a deflated balloon through a hole, which is gonna be easier? A deflated balloon is gonna be easier. So, do, so that's tip number one, is to do it on an empty stomach. And then also, you know, remember that vagus nerve, that pinched, if the vagus nerve runs along here and it's getting pinched. It's getting pinched. So if that stomach is full and you're trying to pull that through and you've already got compromised vagal tone because of, of a pinched nerve, that's just going to make it worse, which is going to give you nausea. It's going to give you indigestion. It's going to give you heart palpitations. It's going to cause 
it could cause a variety of different um, feelings of pain and discomfort. So we want to take care of our vagus nerve. And the best way we can do that is through a breathing practice. And that's why these exercises, one of the reasons why they're so beneficial is to improve that vagal tone, which is really important for all of you know health and body function. It's, it has a lot of important functions in the body. So we need good, strong vagal tone, not a pinched vagus nerve. Mm. Okay, so, so that's number one, is on an empty stomach. And then number two um, would be to, if, if you're this person where these exercises make you feel worse, um, what I would advise is to, I've talked a little bit about this before, but is to lie down at the end of the day with an empty stomach on your back and get comfortable. If you need to prop yourself up, that's fine. I'm going to stand up and just find your hernia. So remember, it's on your left side. Um, and do this, just gently underneath that rib, very slowly lingering around, just palpitate. If you press right here and it gives you anxiety and nausea, then you don't want to press right there. Try coming further to the left over where the fundus, remember your stomach sits like a little bean right here. So we just want to try to start to move that down and this just helps you to find your sweet spot. So if you come down here and you kind of hold and you relax your abs and you breathe and you feel some maybe bubbles and gurgling or maybe a, a feeling of relief or a, like a, a good sensation, then you know you found kind of your sweet spot. You can hold that there, relax your abs and do some breathing. Relax your body, do some deep breathing. That's going to help improve that vagal tone. And you're essentially just holding your stomach down as you breathe, stretching those adhesions um, and practicing relaxing your abs. So this is something just, you know, forget about the stomach, you know, pulling and start with this first. And you can get more into the stomach pulling once you've kind of found your sweet spot, where a good place to touch is, where a good place to touch isn't. And remember also, because your stomach is like this little bean right here, it starts here with your esophagus here and your hernia here, but it kind of curves over here. So if you feel like you just can't touch anywhere without causing more discomfort, you can come down just above your belly button. So my belly button is here. This is the bottom of your stomach and you can gently pull down here and that will just kind of pull it down and again it's going to be different for everybody for me when I did this it it made me more uncomfortable and I think it's more just like a, a general crowding of the intestines that's happening there but you can also just focus on you know scratching just to help those muscles to relax okay that's a real gentle way to start as well so these are just some tips for you to kind of ease into this idea of stomach pulling. Susan says, I do deep breathing every day. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I didn't mean to look um, intimidating there. Um, that's good. Deep breathing every day. That's excellent. So the deep breathing, guys, I know, I mean, a lot of people talk about it and it's one of those things where you hear it and you're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but the, the, here's the thing about, sorry. here's the thing about deep breathing. It's going to improve your vagal tone and it's going to help you manage stress. And stress is such a biggie when it comes to hiatal hernias and health in general. I like to think of stress as holding on. The opposite of stress is releasing. So in the body, we have all of the, we just have a highway system. We have a, a high, like if you think of like a big city with the highway system, like the viaducts and the on ramps and the off ramps, and then it's rush hour and everything's backed up and it's stopped and it's not flowing, right? Well, the same thing with the highway system in our bodies. We have to have good flow everywhere, everywhere. We have the respiratory system. Obviously we need good flow there. We've got the digestive system. We need good flow there. Lymphatic system, nervous system. Um, what else? Um, there are just all of these symptoms and we need we need flow. We need good flow. And so we get these blockages, right? We get a blockage to the heart, we could die. If we get a blockage in our throat, we could die. But there are, you know, even a, a di an intestinal blockage. You may not die in three seconds or three minutes like you would with a, a blockage, you know, no air. 
but it, you know, it could slowly kill you. <laughs> An intestinal blockage could slowly kill you. Lymphatic, you know, we need good flow of lymph um, for immune function. And so we have to have clear passageways. And why do I bring this up and what does this have to do with the breath? When we practice, when we have a meditative practice, um, that's not going to clear out our arteries, you know, a good diet and good exercise is going to clear out our arteries, but um, practicing the breath will help us release tension, okay? And as long as we have tension, whether it's from a physical injury, an emotional injury, or just being scared, being worried, you know, being obsessive, being um, angry, being bitter, you know, not being able to forgive ourselves, not being able to forgive others, all of these things, stress, holding on, um, not being able to release and let go, they create blockages in the body. They create blockages in the body and sometimes it's just a, you know, a matter of energy flow, which again, I know sometimes you hear this and it's like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> energy flow. But we are energy. Our bodies at our most microscopic cellular level we are energy. We are energy and energy flows throughout our body. Like wind, it flows. And if there's blockages because of that stress, then we start to see disease. We start to see complications and we start to see disease. So we must have flow. And by relaxing, by breathing, letting go, relaxing, we can have flow. And if you incorporate in like a positive mindset during your meditation, Prayer, whether you're praying for yourself or someone you love, um, connecting with God, a higher power, um, positive affirmations, I am happy, I am well, I am at peace, um, um, my body is open and I'm releasing blockages so that energy can flow to those areas that are injured and create, because the body is always trying to heal, right? I mean, this kind of sounds like this magical woo-woo stuff, but if you fall down right now and cut your knee, your body knows how to heal that, right? Your body knows how to heal that scrape, and it will go right to work doing it without any help from you. The only thing you need to do is give it a little TLC, right? You might need to keep it clean. You might need to not fall on that knee repetitively and keep reopening that wound. You might need to rest. So these are all things we can incorporate into a, a simple breathing practice that's free, it's easy, it's enjoyable, it just takes a commitment, which means set an alarm on your phone and do it every day. <laughs> all right, so that's enough about breathing. Um, Krista, I, I hope that helps. Um, I hope you were here from the beginning, but we talked about um, gross motor sk skills, gross motor movements, and how the abs are always engaging. You say you work in a cafeteria and you lift and move most of your day. Yeah. Yeah. Is lifting hurting me more? Well, Christy, you know, yeah. So when we lift, the, the abs contract and they're engaged. They're engaged and they're working harder than normal. And so, and so yes, that when those abs contract, it supports that pushing up of the stomach. So there, I mean, you can try... For those of you that are in the same situation as Christy, where it's like, well, I have, you know, it's my job. You know, you have a couple of choices. One is you can, you can practice prioritizing self-care, which means taking time throughout the day to stretch your abs. And so how do we do that? Again, we, we expand the belly. We just expand it like a balloon. So we press it out. And now I'm stretching these abdominal muscles by pressing that out. And yeah, that's going to create a strain on your low back. So then you need to do those back exercises that I showed at the top of the, um, at the top of the live to um, compensate for that. So, so some self care to the abs to stretch those out, um, to compensate for that heavy lifting is something that you can try. Um, once you master the ability to move the stomach down, you can also kind of hold it down throughout the day. This is what I did when I first started, you know, I just, I walked around like this all the time, just holding that stomach down because I didn't want it to push back up into the diaphragm. So this was before I was actually able to strengthen my diaphragm. Oh, thank you, Krista. Oh, that uh, I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so you can try that too. You can try holding it down throughout the day, but you know you need to master moving the stomach down first and then hold it down with your hand. 
Um, and certainly, you know, keep the long game in mind, Krista. You know, you got to learn how to move the stomach down and you got to strengthen that diaphragm. But, you know, for some people, you know, and I know this isn't, you don't, you know, a lot of people don't want to hear this, but maybe, you know, if your job is not supporting healing and you just cannot get away from constantly pushing that stomach up, it may be time for a new job or a break from your job or some type of a change. And I know that's a hard, a hard advice to hear. I know it's a hard advice to hear, but we must do what's best for our health and we must do what's holistic for our health. And so what does that mean? It means that, you know, just doing one thing for our health, like taking a pill or just doing one exercise may not be enough. We may need to do a comprehensive additional things to support our health. That may mean a change in our job. It may mean a change in where we live. It may mean a change in, you know, it could mean a lot of different changes. So you have to figure out what that is for you. And that can take effort, that can take creativity, it can take time to figure all that out. It could take, you know, working with a professional to help you figure that out. It could take talking to somebody, you know, to kind of work through and unravel all of these things that you're trying to figure out. It could take journaling, sitting down and just really asking yourself these questions. Like, ideally, what do I need to do to support health? In a perfect world, what would that be? What would that look like? Write it all down. And then once you have a picture of what you need to do that's going to be ideal for your health, what's going to be ideal to promote your healing, um, then, you're, then you kind of have a roadmap of the action that you need to take. And you can start taking those steps little by little, day by day, step by step, baby steps, whatever that looks like for you. Um, maybe you're going to work with your family, have a support system. Maybe you're going to work with a professional. Maybe you're going to do it all on your own. I don't know. Everyone's going to be different, but, but you can do it. You can do it. Um, these big changes in life can sometimes be stressful and difficult, but in the, in the long run, in the end game, they can be life changing and they can be beneficial and they can be good. So it just really takes um, being courageous and taking that time to really look at your life and your health and your priorities and figuring out what's gonna work for you. Terry says, Christy, I worked for 30 years in school food service. I think all of the lifting is at the root of my hiatal hernia. I am learning a lot now from Pam. Oh, thank you, Terry. I appreciate that um, encouragement for Christy. Um, but yeah, definitely heavy lifting causes a lot of hernias, not just hiatal hernias, but all kinds of hernias. Um, so it's just basically it's straining beyond what we can tolerate, straining beyond our own level of strength and what we can tolerate and then repetitive straining. So for example, 30 years of heavy lifting for Terry, that's repetitive, repetitive straining um, beyond what she could tolerate. And so does that mean we can never, you know, do things that are, you know, physically difficult again? No, but it means we need to keep our bodies strong if we want to be able to tolerate those things, which means, you know, a daily walk or lifting weights or going to a gym or whatever that means for you, a Zumba class, boxing, tennis, I don't know, whatever it means for you. Um, but yeah, we, in order to keep our bodies strong, we need to use and move our bodies. That's just, that's just the way it is. So... All right. Okay, guys, I have a big day ahead of me. I hope this has been beneficial. Um, thank you for engaging with me. That was fun. I appreciate you guys um, watching along with me and adding in um, participation. Krista says I did a lot of weightlifting and pretty dramatic movements with a 44-pound kettlebell. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing about, you know, workouts my workouts people sometimes laugh at me at the gym because I, <laughs> i'm very gentle on my body i i push myself a little bit but i would say i focus more on gentle exercise than aggressive extreme exercise and pushing myself i push myself a little bit but not much <laughs> um but for me, you know, I'm not an Olympic athlete. It's not my job to be, you know, a superior physical specimen. Um, I try to do what, what works and supports me. Um, I want strong bones. I want energy. I want to be flexible. I want to be independent. So those are my goals. 
Um, so I try to do the exercises that support that. Um, I want to keep my stomach down, so I have a daily practice that you know manages and maintains that. So we need to figure out what works for us individually. And Pamela is asking about um, jumping um, on a rebounder. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this question. And um, oh, I said I would give my testimony, so I'll tell. I'm going to tell a quick story, and then I'm going to go. Um, so I think rebounding is great. I think rebounding is great for a hiatal hernia. Um, you'll want to start out very gentle, very easy, just with some little relaxing bounding. Um, focus on um, relaxing while you're bounding. Relax your jaw, make sure your teeth aren't touching each other, relax your shoulders, your neck, relax your abs. And just start out really light. And like I've been talking about throughout this live, if that creates more discomfort from you, you should understand why now. It's because that stomach is tugging but it's not releasing. It's because you're irritating the vagus nerve, you're irritating already irritated tissues. So start out with what's comfortable for you. Maybe you're just gonna do 10 seconds and then you feel nauseous and you're gonna stop, okay? But be consistent, do it every day. Do it on an empty stomach, meaning um, without food. You can drink some warm water, that's fine, because that will kind of weight the stomach. But don't do it if your, food is, if your stomach's full of food. But I think rebounding is great. And you, can, you don't have to have a rebounder. You can just relax your abs and just do this. And it doesn't have to be jumping. I know a lot of people online talk about, you know, jumping off of your porch or jumping down steps or coming down really hard on your heels. That's not what it's about. It's more about, it's about, no, it's just about this kind of this tugging motion. Ding, ding, ding. A little bit of bouncing. It doesn't take much. It's, you're just trying to stretch it. It's not about an aggressive, quick, one swoop. I reversed my hiatal hernia. Okay. It's about the long game. So, so I do. I, I think I think rebounding is very beneficial. But just start out easy. Okay, and relax your abs. So, <coughs> so I, <coughs> I um, I was spending about at least five minutes a day, sometimes two or three times a day, I would take five minutes. Every day at work, I would go to a corner and lay down on the floor and hope nobody found me there. And I would do like I was saying, I would just kind of slowly look for those bubbles. Just very slowly, relax the abs, just relax everything, just breathe, 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 breathe. I did this every day. And I continued to have a little bit of relief, but a lot of discomfort and a lot of symptoms throughout my day. Um, one day, my husband and I were at somebody's home for a group Bible study, and I was in so much pain, so much discomfort. I had anxiety, a lot of anxiety, and I was sitting there trying to hold still and pay attention, and all I could think about was just wanting to run out of that house screaming. I had so much anxiety. And I excused myself and I actually went into the bathroom of this person's house and I thought, well, I'm going to do, um, I'm a yoga instructor and I used to be really into yoga. I'm going to do some poses and see if I can't calm myself down. So I did a downward dog and I did um, like a cat and a cow pose. So I'm down on this bathroom floor in somebody's, you know, house. It was clean, but still, and I'm doing like child's pose down on this bathroom floor. And I'm getting a little bit of relaxation, but still just a lot of pain and discomfort at the hernia. And um, I stood up and I stood and I was standing in front of the mirror in this like dimly lit bathroom. I don't think I bothered to turn the light on. And I was standing there staring at myself. And I just reached up and I did this. I leaned to the right. And I felt and I heard um, a pop and a sensation of release and relief. And I literally, I just stood there. I just stood there and I didn't want to move because it felt so good and I knew what had happened. I was like, my stomach just dislodged from my diaphragm. It just, I, I felt it and I heard it and I, and, and I felt this, literally just this, I mean, I was sitting in this Bible study, I had anxiety, I had pain, I, was, I couldn't stop burping, I had nausea, I had indigestion, I was so uncomfortable. And I was like fidgeting and trying to like do my little things and trying to get my stomach down with my fingers and trying to breathe and relax my abs and nothing would work. I think that stomach was just sitting 
just on the brink of getting fully dislodged, but it was putting a lot of pressure on the nerve. I don't know. But for, other, for whatever reason, I was really uncomfortable. And so here I was in this bathroom, and I fully dislodged, and I just had all this relief. I stopped burping. The nausea vanished. The pain vanished, which is surprising. Um, I think it was just those final adhesions being pulled, and then just once it got released, I don't know, I just the pain went away, the indigestion went away. I mean, I literally, I just wanted to stand there for the rest of my life. It felt so good. It felt so good. And I didn't want to go back in there and sit down and have all of that come back. So I took about five minutes and I did, did some breathing and I really just worked my stomach down and I really stretched out my abs, really just made my belly nice and big. I got everything relaxed, you know, I was just in the state of my, everything was just like, argh, I was just holding on to so much tension. I just really just got my, did some meditation, I prayed, and then I went back out and I sat down on the couch and I was fine. I was literally fine for the rest of the night. Um, now, did my stomach ever push back up? Yeah, it did. It did, but I knew how to get it down instantly. And then from that point on, that's when I went around just like holding my stomach down all the time because as long as it was down, I felt great. I felt great, um, but that's where that diaphragm exercise comes in and tightening, get, getting that diaphragm in as good a shape as you can, tightening your hiatus, and then just continuing the maintenance and just you know breathing into the belly, recognizing when you have stress, releasing that you know the stress in the abdomen. So again, this is a long game. This is a big picture. It doesn't usually happen in moments or in a day or overnight. Um, very rarely does that happen for people. Usually it is, takes a time and commitment. And holisticness and gentleness and self-care and self-love. Okay? All right, guys. So um, thanks for joining. And I'm going to take off. But um, I'll see you back here on Tuesday. And we'll be cooking in the kitchen. All right. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks for watching.